Uh, good afternoon. My name is Mark Burroughs. I'm the chairman of the Energy Institute's Yorkshire branch, and I've got the uh, I think pleasure in um, introducing this event today, the, uh, the Energy Conscious Organisation Taster Session. So what it's all about is obviously a lot of organisations have net zero goals at the moment. They're, they've got on their drive to reduce energy use and, and associated CO2. Um, but from my perspective, and probably a lot of people on this call, there's been a there's a continual focus on on more technology streams um, to try and you know hit these targets and get there where they want to be, uh, and that's you know an engineering led um, philosophy normally. Um, but from from a, a stance of the Energy Institute and as a, an energy manager myself, we, we don't think we're going to get there. Um, what it's telling me, I've, I've recently done some work on this, and large organisations uh, with the technology on the shelf at the moment will probably maybe take 30, 40% of that target um, and maybe hit those short term targets. But in terms of being net zero by 2030 and onwards, it's going to be an uphill challenge until there's a, a real step change and, and transformation in the technology available. So we do need to look at all options and inclusive of that for me is is behavior change. And this is where this, this session fits in and the uh, the the ENCO philosophy. Um, it's always been a challenge to get behavior change up and running in organizations. I'm sure that people, a lot of people on the call will sympathize. I've, ha I've been part of programs that may may have, have succeeded or failed uh, for various reasons, but typically, you know, it's something you can't just purchase out of a catalog. It is it, a challenge. It's difficult to achieve. It involves people. Um, it's difficult to get through organizations in terms of a business case, typically. Um, people always want that magic return on investment or payback, and it, it's not that easy to, you know, commit to something. Uh, when you base it on people's behaviour uh, and the way they interact into their, their job role on a daily basis. Uh, there's also very variable capability in the marketplace from in-house energy managers and consultants feeding into that market. Um, so how they tackle things, their capability to do that and to make a difference. And I think this is where ENCO is really stepping in now. This is something that's very interesting for me. I've undertaken this training, this, this ENCO training myself. Because I, I I believe in it. I believe it's a massive part of what we need to do to achieve our net zero ambitions uh, collectively. And I'm very very pleased that John, who's one of the kind of founders of this, has come on today to to explain in, in a little bit more detail. And hopefully we can share that amongst our peers and amongst our colleagues and networks and think this is could be a a bit of a game changer on on the behaviour side of energy management and broader uh, carbon management. So, um, no further ado, John, please. Uh, proceed thank you okay <clears throat> thank you very much mark and uh, good afternoon everyone thank you for investing uh, 45 minutes of your time in this session um i'm delighted you've done that and we're going i'm going to talk for about 20 minutes and then we're going to have a, a 20 minute discussion so uh, that's the idea so if you keep your comments to the discussion period at the end we'll have plenty of time uh, for that um so let me just uh, introduce the whole subject and talk us through it so um So here is um, the uh, first slide coming up there. You can see it. Um, actually, if we're going to save energy in a significant way, we've got to really address uh, people, technology, and data information systems simultaneously. Uh, one can't isolate, uh, can't work in isolation without the other. So if you have just people or behavioural solutions on their own, without the proper links into the technology and the data. They don't work. And similarly, if you've got technology and you don't address the behavioural issues, the investment that you uh, and the savings that you thought you're going to get from the technology won't be realised. So it's really important these three things operate together. And that's essentially what ENCO is. We're not saying that it's more important or less important than technology or data, but it's a, an equal measure to the other two. And that's what it's all about. A quote from uh, a guy called Oliver Blatch, who works for The Guardian, and he's basically talking. I'll just give you a moment to read it. Okay. It's essentially saying that uh, if we're going to change behaviors, we need to equip other people to do it. That's what he says at the end there. This quote's in two parts. And equipping others is what the long term goal really is of ENCO. Essentially, it's to get large organisations to adopt behavioural techniques in their energy management strategy, but also with energy professionals 
to equip them to work both within organizations if they're employed by them, but also equip external professionals such as energy consultants uh, who can have an influence over these organizations and particularly ESOS lead assessors and auditors because ESOS lead assessors and auditors are working in the 9,000 largest private sector organizations, but that's not to neglect the public sector where there's a big energy bill there. So that's those are the we're thinking about. And one thing that uh, Blatch says is basically that the environmental problem is mainly a behavioral problem. And if we think about man-made climate change, the clue as to how it changed is in that is that term. It's man-made. And therefore, if we're going to reverse climate change, there has to be a very big behavioral element to it, because without it, it just isn't going to work. So that's just a, an introduction to behavior change. Now on to ENCO. Um, as Mark said in his introduction, that it, behavior change is a bit of a forgotten link in the march towards net zero or, or the race to net zero, as it's now called. And really, uh, Esther in the energy uh, um, Systems uh, Technical Association, ESTA and EI, um, are basically joining together to try and affect the savings that are waiting to be saved. So typically in many organisations, half the energy savings could be achieved by technical issues and about the other half where there is a largely behavioural element to it. And one example of that was when I did an ESOS energy audit uh, back in um, 2015 and suggested to them that they could make a 25% reduction in energy consumption by um, just basically switching off things in the quiet periods in the evening and um, and at night. And the other 25% could be saved by putting in LED lighting. And uh, this organisation then implemented the measure and sure enough, they saved 25% of their electricity. And if they invested those savings in the LED, they would make a 50% reduction in electricity consumption. Now you might say, well, that's a pretty inefficient organization. However, there's plenty out there like that. And um, your organization might be far more efficient, but nevertheless, there is uh, plenty of potential for change. So what we're trying to do is make uh, behavioural change mainstream in, in uh, basically society as well as just industry and commerce. And we're trying to do uh, basically three things here. The first is that we're gathering together evidence of uh, case studies, projects uh, that have been uh, proven to save energy through behavioural change. I'll come back to that in a bit more in a moment. Um, we are also aiming to build capacity by training up energy professionals uh, to affect change within organizations, either their own or the clients that they're working for. And we've got off to a great start on that. We'll talk more about that in a moment. And then we're also cooperating, uh, collaborating and cooperating with government to try and um, make this sort of mainstream uh, in their policy thinking, uh, because at the moment, Behavioural change projects are largely discriminated against uh, by government projects. So typically you can get plenty of grants for technical measures, but you can't get any grants for behavioural me me um, measures. So what we're trying to do there is to sort of reverse that. And uh, we're making some progress, but it has been fairly slow, but we're, we're getting there, I think. <laughs> um, so we're, that's it. The idea is to make it mainstream. The ENCO organization, the Energy Conscious organization, has got its own website. It's got a lot of good free resources on that for you to access under resources and case studies. And it's got some useful tools, one of which is the ENCO matrix, which I'll talk about um, in a moment. But uh, it'd be good to go and visit that site uh, and uh, have a look around. We're in the process of revamping it. so. Um, it is slightly clunky at the moment, but it's improving and we're just sort of um, improving things as we go. Um, and a lot of the people who are doing this are doing it on a purely voluntary basis. It's a not for profit uh, enterprise and um, we're doing this in order to promote the whole subject because we believe in it. 
ENCO basically consists of five pillars, if you like, and they're shown here. Engagement, alertness, skills, recognition and adaption. And they characterize what an energy conscious organization is. And it provides, um, as it were, a peg to try and figure out where are we in our progress to becoming this sort of organization. And the idea behind it is to get people to focus on the key areas that are going to make the biggest difference as fast as possible. And so uh, those five aspects have then been put into what we call the ENCO matrix. On the left hand column, the blue column, you've got those five aspects, engagement, alert, and adaption. <clears throat> and there are, you'll notice there are five columns starting at uh, column naught, <clears throat> excuse me, and going up to column four. And column naught means pretty much not non existence, there's nothing much happening there. Um, and then column four is, I suppose you could say, is best practice ENCO organization. Um, but to be an ENCO, an ENCO, an ENCO organ organization, you don't have to be at level four. It's a question of setting out on the journey and figuring out where you are. And the idea is to assess what and the profile on the left, the red one, indicates uh, an organization and it's got the date there, May 2013. And then it's got the um, the green one after the intervention where it's February 2015. And you can see that sometimes the scoring is between the cells because you may have achieved, say, level naught. Yeah, sorry, yeah, you've got past level naught, uh, but you haven't yet achieved level one, in which case you put the tick between uh, level naught and one. So this is a um, gap analysis um, a tool uh, it enables you to be able to assess where your organization is. And after this session, uh, Robin, the organizer at uh, EI, will send out a paper that comes from the ENCO course, which goes into the ENCO matrix in a lot more detail. But also, practitioners tab, you will see an electronic version of this in a spreadsheet. And there you can just click on a box, the color will change color. And on the right hand column, you'll get a score. And the scoring system for this is in uh, four categories. There is gold, which is at the top end, silver, bronze. And then if you go below a certain score, it's called unclassified. In other words, you're at the bottom of the pile. But the good news is that if you've got a very low score, it means there's very high potential for change and a very high potential for making savings. So if you do score yourself low, don't be discouraged because that's a good sign. It means there's only one way and that's upwards and uh, that's that's great. So if you go on the ENCO website, you'll see this tool that's uh, sitting there waiting there. And this how we operate this tool and how we score it and everything is explained <clears throat> as part of one of the four modules on the ENCO. The case studies um, and the resources are all on the website I've mentioned. Um, and if you go on to the uh, resources section, you, you'll be able to see behavior change and the case studies self-explanatory. They're typically two or three pages and um, describe the saving organizations by real behavior change projects. And the idea is that you can use these to are they get inspired or to try and convince senior management that this um, this is not pie in the sky it actually works in real organizations. <coughs> and the uh, ENCO training is basically um, a, a series of four modules, each of them two hours. Um, at the end of the module four, there is a short exam. And if you pass it, you become what's called a registered ENCO consultant. Um, and the cost of the course is shown there. Um, we, last year in 2020, we ran two courses. We've got four running in parallel at the moment. Um, and later on in the year, we've got another six courses planned. So there's a lot going on with the ENCO training and Mark himself, as he mentioned, has been on the training. Um, we're trying to attract 
quite a lot of either large end users of energy or energy consultants. And if you are in the Energy Institute, which you might be because this is uh, an EI event, if you're a lead assessor with the Energy Institute, that means you're on the RPEC, the Register of Professional Energy Consultants, um, you can come on the course free of charge. If you are a chartered energy manager with the Energy Institute, you can come on it free of charge. If you are a lead assessor with another organisation like SIBSI or EMMA, and we've got those on the course, you get a 20% 20% discount. So, um, uh, you know, what has the EI ever done for you? Well, it's offering you here £500 worth of training for absolutely nothing. And at the end of it, if you pass the exam, you'll get a qualification even that is approved by the EI and ESTA. Um, now, one of the things that we have been doing with the uh, BAYS, um, the Department for Business, Energy, Industrial Strategy, um, they've uh, given us this quotation, which I'll give you a moment just to read if you wish, uh, which essentially gives a rationale for behaviour change. One of the things that um, Gary Shanahan, who is the head of industrial energy, um, is basically saying is that there is evidence in ESOS audit reports that behaviour change measures and opportunities are very rarely mentioned. Sometimes they are. I, I'm an ESOS lead assessor. I'm also an auditor for the Environment Agency on the work some of you who are ESOS lead assessors have done. And I can tell you, <laughs> I've. Uh, very rarely found any opportunities that are shown in ESOS reports relating to behaviour. Uh, and maybe I just got the wrong ones, because um, I'm sure others have done. But um, certainly the overall picture that Bayes is saying is that behaviour changes are neglected in ESOS audits. He's then given us this endorsement. I'll just give you a moment to read it. So if you're an ESOS lead assessor or an ESOS auditor, it's important that you include behaviour change as part of your recommendations. And in order to get equipped by that, the best way you can do it is to come on an ENCO course. I'm not apologetic about it because there isn't any other course like this. And the people who have been on it uh, think very highly. One from British Gas. and vote from team software. And in fact, this week, one of Tim Holman's colleagues who came on the course, Sam RJ, qualified as what is called an approved ENCO practitioner. So congratulations to team for that. So if you attend the course, the, the four modules and pass the exam, you become a registered ENCO consultant. So far, there are 35. By the end of this month, there'll be another 70, so that will take it over to 100, and then there'll be about 120 more in the rest of this year. So we're making really good progress. But having attended the course doesn't mean that you're uh, equipped, because actually the only way you can get fully equipped is to actually go and do it. So the idea then is to go out into the real world, do a real behaviour change project, prove that it's made the savings by behaviour change, come back, apply back to us at uh, ENCO. Um, you have to fill in some paperwork, produce a case study, undergo a rigorous interview, and then the committee will decide whether or not you're fit to be an approved ENCO practitioner. So, so far there's only four of us, but we're hoping that by the end of this year, there will be about at least 25 or 30. And those names will be put in a prominent position on the ENCO website. So if any organization wants to do a behavioral change project and wants to put uh, recruit someone who knows something about it, they know where to go. And that is on the ENCO website. So that's the 
status of approved ENCO practitioner. To become an ENCO registered organisation, you have to be able to prove that you've done a no certain number of steps, that a representative from the organisation then completes an application form um, and um, fills in uh, an evidence pack that's rigorously examined. And then initially um, you become a registered organisation for three years with an annual review and you pay a fee to become one. So far we don't have any, but we've got three very large organisations lined up, one of which is Rolls-Royce, also a large water company and also a large telecoms company. So um, we think that once we get about a dozen of those large organisations with household names, then uh, other people will want this um, uh, logo and approval, as it were, that they are addressing behaviour change in a serious and a rigorous way within their organisation. We've also got an, an organisation called the ENCO Academy, which is a base registered ENCO organisations, practitioners and consultants who've been through the course. And uh, we meet every three months. We've got the next meeting in April. We had one in January. And we're also in discussion with psychologists because if you think about it, psychologists should be at the cutting edge of addressing climate change and behaviours, but they're not. So we aim to change that. So we're trying to recruit um, organisations who employ fully professional psychologists. Though there are exceptions, like I know in Mark's organisation, they've done very good work in this area. And there are one or two other organisations as well, but generally it's not happening. And we also want to spread ENCO around the world. So we've got people from the course from different countries and we want to ideally run these um, modules in different time zones. So people across the other side of the world, you know, don't have to get up in the middle of the night to attend a, an ENCO course. And we've also got a sponsorship scheme whereby companies can um, sponsor ENCO. And as I mentioned, we've got bays behind it. Um, one or two people have mentioned the whole issue of how do you measure behaviour change savings? Because if there are other things going on in the organisation, how do you, how can you really prove that it's behaviour that's made the difference? That's a really important question. And that's why with our ENCO case studies, where we can, we really want to get them approved according to the international protocol on measurement and verification and where we want to be able to separate out, separate out the behavioural element from technical uh, measures. Um, so therefore, when we're doing ENCO case studies, we've got people who've been on the ENCO course who are qualified IPMVP um, trained people. I'm not one myself, but I do believe in it. I believe that it's very important. Um, and so, but so what we do is, is we put uh, uh, clients in touch with these uh, people who um, are both IPMVP uh, people, but also who have um, been on the ENCO course and are already um, registered ENCO consultants. And just on the issue of consultants, one of the things we say to people is that a consultant can either be internal to an organisation or external. So, for instance, you might have an energy professional working in, as an energy manager within an organisation, say typically in the EI, a chartered energy manager. Um, so, in that sense, they are internal consultants because they're trying to do the same things the external consultants are doing here on behaviour change, which is to affect change within organisations. And so, we, we use those terms internal and external consultant. And that's why we use the term registered ENCO consultant. And so with the uh, calculations for the savings, there's all the formulas that some of you are familiar with there. And um, we do need to, um, you, know, you might need to assess whether you need additional metering and everything. Apologies for the slight spelling error. Um, and then another issue that um, committee members in the um, TI Yorkshire branch have raised have been to do with maintaining momentum. And I fully agree with this concern that 
what we want to avoid is behavioural change programmes being a flash in the pan, here today, gone tomorrow. You know, you make some big savings, but they only last for six months. How do you overcome that? So we address that on the ENCO course. We have quite a lot on the whole momentum issue. And in fact, I've written a whole paper about this, which you can find on the resource section of the um, ENCO website. And really, just a quick word on this before we have the question and answer session. Um, one way to address momentum is to make sure that it's designed in the intervention at the very beginning. Because very often people start thinking about momentum when they start to lose momentum. <laughs> it's a little bit late there. So what you've got to do is to go back right to the start and say, when we're designing an intervention, what element of this intervention, what, what elements have got momentum and, and what elements don't? That's really important. And then the other area is management and organisational practices, which I'll come to in the next slide. Uh, what, what is already there and how can we harness that to maintain the momentum? And then the last one uh, is ISO 50001, the International Energy Management System Standard, which I'm a great adv advocate for. I've, I've put it into a lot of organisations. I've seen the difference. Anyone who's been involved with ISO 50001 knows that it's a lever for cultural change in organisations. And also in ISO 50001, you've got elements, clauses like competence, awareness, communication. There's all sorts of training and behavioural change elements built into 50001. For instance, you've got to have top management, you've got to have an energy management team. Um, there's all sorts of things in uh, a system standard where momentum is built in, if you like, because you're already, already having things like internal audits, external audits, you're having management reviews on a regular basis. So engagement is actually there. So I'm a great fan of that for maintaining them. And as far as management and organisational practices are concerned, there are all sorts of things within organisations already which can be harnessed for behaviour change without having to invent new information highways or systems. There is a lot of stuff that's already there that you can use. And that's why the challenge for us as energy professionals is to not just be energy consultants, but to be management consultants as well. And that means being able to analyse organisations and figuring out what are the best methods for getting change done in organisations. It's much easier for us to train energy professionals in this than it is to train management consultants to become energy consultants. Something to think about. So, on that note, I've said enough, and we've got about um, 15 to 20 minutes for questions uh, or contributions or comments. So, over to you. Thanks for that, John. Um, to be honest, I don't know, uh, do people on the uh, attendees have the uh, medium to, to turn their microphones on? I'm unsure. As a panelist, and maybe speak, or do you want to type a question if you're not comfortable? I have a question to to kind of kick things off while people have a think. Um, yeah. Where do you see uh, Enco evolving or growing in the future? I, from, from my perspective, I think you know this is a new a, new, a very old idea finally done well. Uh, that we're putting some form and, and template to to the way to behavior change. But do you, where do you see it evolving and growing in the future? Well, um, I think one of the things that I mentioned there was the whole idea of the international aspect, uh, Mark. And I think um, that that can really help because um, we want to grow right across the world. We don't want it just to be something that's done in Britain where it's begun. Um, I think the other thing obviously, is that we want to try and get into most of the 9,000 organisations that are in ESOS, affect them. And then we want to make sure that the public sector is addressed, um, the NHS, local authorities, universities. So essentially, when, wherever large amounts of energy are used, and we haven't really got a strategy at the moment for SMEs, though, though we recognise that that is a, a big sector. Um, and um, I think the thing is that because it's all fairly new and just starting, we're sort of 
not quite laying tracks as the train's coming down, but sometimes it feels a bit like that. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, so, so there's, but we're open to suggestions. So if anyone's got any ideas and thinks, why don't you do this? Or why don't you do that? We're open to suggestions. That's a very, very good point at the end, I think. Yeah, I think that that's the, the bit I've noted, not just the given, uh, you know, a standard set of tools and a way of doing things is the open invite that we are here to, uh, you know, shape, shape this proposition a bit more as professionals and, and basically arm our industry. I think that's what's been lacking from my perspective last 20 years. We, we're not really filled up appropriately to tackle behavior change. And I think this is the, the really big start, you know, something quite big. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all for it and I'm actually endorse it as best I can. Yeah. Um, Mark, I just wondered, can I just ask you a quick one? Because I mentioned you in passing about the psychologists. Mm -hmm. And that, that is a big area that we want to address because a lot of psychologists are involved with behaviour change, but they don't seem to have much interest in the environment. And the biggest issue facing mankind is climate change. So I would just like to see uh, how psychologists could be more involved. But you've been at the cutting edge of this in your organisation. Yeah, we we were lucky when I joined the organisation. You know, where they wanted to embrace this, but I think I think the difference is that that person or persons we had were both in academic and in in the business world. And I think that's the problem we've got a lot. The the, the psychologist is is in the academic world. We need to put out branches and and, and put out long arms to kind of pull these people into our world and, and show them that one there is a, a role for them there, and it's 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 a big problem that they can help address. Um, they may just not be aware of it or what they're doing might be in, insulated to their individual research topic or often their uh, their funding they get to do their research so can we influence funding can we can we get our academic partners can we get our friends in this to start in, engaging and again this is where the community aspect i think comes in and, and, and sharing you know there's something now out there this is brand brand new um can you get involved in any way okay, let's learn more and that's hopefully what people on today's call, we'll go away and have a think about and think, can they do it either there for their organisation or can they influence their their friends and family or whatever it may be to to, to, to jump in and, and uh, dip a toe in the water. Um, I think it's just worth uh, worth saying for me, I, I mean, there's, there's obviously a, a, you know, there's a cost to this training, there's a cost to anything. For me, you know, investing in this, it wasn't a case of the money. The money's there to make sure there's value attached to the the ENCO training. There's that people do attend, and it and it gets your uh, your boss or your boss's boss, you know, interested in in what you're you're doing. It, it, I think um, if you don't have a monetary value, people might just uh, pay lip service and not attend those four training sessions. It's a commitment uh, with that financial backing. But as far as I'm concerned, it's not there to make John Har here or any other people on the on the oodles of cash and we prop up their pension funds um that is not the case this is like I say tooling up our industry as best we can um, yeah, yeah that's why I'm yeah. Endorsing. i wouldn't endorse it it was just the money making exercise no no no, no, no. and, it, and it, it is not for profit we're not and, and to be fair the, some of the people have given a lot of their own time over the last three years completely free of charge to get this thing going including myself and jez Rutter and others um i noticed on the chat there that uh, vicky um, has mentioned that there are opportunities to link 14,001 as um, to 14,001 um, for organisations who don't have 9,001 or 50,001. And I thank you for that, Vicky. That's a really good point um, because uh, 14,001, as we know, is the Environmental Management System standard, which has been out for over 20 years now. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a good standard. It it just covers the environment. Um, it, well, it covers all aspects of the environment. Um, whereas fifty thousand and one just covers energy. Um, so, yeah, if you're looking for a broader sustainability approach, that that's great to do. We some people ask us why does Enco not just cover every aspect of the environment, like waste and water and everything else. And we've just decided to focus entirely on energy. And um, that that is because that's where the biggest savings are going to be in greenhouse gases, usually for most organisations. However, you know, the broader environmental stuff is great as well. And I I fully agree with you, Vicky, that 14,001, if people have got that, to try and uh, use that as the as part of the momentum and to 
use the system that you've got for continual improvement. So, yeah. And then Vicky, you've mentioned also you've not heard of IPM VP consultants. What is it? Well, IPM uh, VP is the International Performance Measurement and Verification Protocol. So if you type those letters into Google, you'll be able to download the protocol free of charge off the internet. And essentially what it is, it's a very rigorous internationally agreed method to, to agree on how you can calculate savings from uh, interventions and measures in organizations from an energy point of view. How can you actually prove the savings? Because one of the problems with um, savings is you can't measure them directly because it's energy that's not used. Does that make sense? So, so therefore, if you, how do you measure something that hasn't happened? That is the essential question. And the way that you answer that question is to say, what would have happened if we hadn't had that intervention? And the difference between what would have happened and what has happened is essentially the savings that you've achieved. And that's what IPMVP is all about. And because it's an internationally agreed mechanism there are a lot of organizations who are on um, energy services contracts or performance contracts who use this methodology because it is internationally agreed everybody knows what it means but in order to be able to do an assessment you have to have someone who's properly qualified and therefore various institutions run courses which uh, do that including Esther and um, I'm not sure if the EI does. Does the EI do it, Mark? No, they don't. No, no, no. Okay, but there are other institutions who, whereby you can become qualified as a consultant, and um, if you're interested in that field, I suggest that's what you do. Yeah, I hope it's, that answers that question. Yeah, it's very much used for energy performance contracting. Um, I see. Well, it's been proven. It, some people in the course, some of the original, kind of. Uh, Spearhead, spearheading people, Jez Rutter, has, has actually enabled a behavior change program under using measurement and verification. So they give a performance guarantee on the back of behavior change and their intervention. Now, I think that's massive. And now, do, do I was on the call, including myself on this, can, can we achieve that in the next five months? No, we, we're going to have to get good at what we do. But um, we're going to do that by having a go at this, sharing our experiences with the community and and maybe move towards that in, in the future. Um, I, but it's, it's, it is there, it's a precedent, and I think that's very exciting. Yeah, great. Anyone else like to ask a question or share anything? I have no view of the questions personally, so uh, I don't know what's going on. Just as a, a housekeeping error on my behalf, I was supposed to mention this right at the beginning that we are being recorded, so oh, my, my faux pas is recorded as well. Right, so okay. <laughs> Mark, another thing that you have contributed to ENCO is that you've got a case study up on the uh, ENCO website, haven't you? Yes, yes, we do. It was from my colleague, who hit the carbon psychologist we mentioned before, and their intervention, intervention at Tata Steel. Um, like I say, using a lot of the kind of core tools were shared on the ENCO train I went on, but they took it that bit further to really delve into psychological profiling of the workforce uh, in a quantitative and qualitative fashion. So, um, so what they were suggesting in the interventions that, that fell part of the ENCO, the, the plan, were based on fact, not fiction. And I think this is quite a big evolution step um, in energy behavior change. But before we can get to that, um, that very advanced stage we need to you know we need to get the basics under to underway we need to get the the energy professional masses all on the same hymn sheet uh and, and then we've got a, a firm grounding before we really you know push push the boundaries of what could be done um i i have been part i partake in those things and it's it's phenomenal what you can find but you've got to have an innovative adventurous customer or, or energy manager who's willing to really you know spend money to to delve into that information um, and that's half the battle. So the more good case studies, the more people we get on the practice in this and the more momentum we get as a, as a marketplace on energy behavior change, you know, in a formulaic and standardized fashion, uh, the better platform we're going to have to make some sub significant changes going forward into, you know, the mid of, mid middle of this decade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
Can I just, I mean, I, I don't want to stop anyone asking any questions, so I'm going to ask again if anyone would like to, but if if there isn't, I'd, I have one or two other comments just to make. So uh, our time is sort of gradually coming to an end, but was there anybody else out there who'd like to either comment on the chat line or ask a question? There aren't any on there right now. All right, okay. Um, well, let, is it okay if I, I, I just um, finish off with a little story? It's, um, uh, is that appropriate, Robin? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm not sure what the story is, but yeah, I'm sure it is. <laughs> it depends on the story. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, Robin. It, uh, could you say what you said before? I wasn't quite sure what, what you said. That there aren't um, any questions or the. Not right now, but there's uh, a man called Gary who I'm currently messaging about. Um, he, you can, Gary, you can just send your question into the chat and then John or Mark can pick it up there, please. Yeah, OK. Well, while we're waiting for that to come through, um, just uh, one of the case studies that are on the that's on the website is uh, a manufacturer in Cambridgeshire where I did this ESOS audit that I mentioned earlier. And I just wanted to sort of give a bit more detail on that to show the flavour of what behaviour um, can do. But when I went to do, to do the ESOS audit and saw the half hourly electricity data with the high base loads in the wrong periods, uh, it was obvious that there was a lot of equipment that was left on. And I suggested to them that they basically switched it off, but nothing actually happened for three years. And when I went back for phase two of ESOS, they they had started to do it and, and were making really significant savings. And I asked them, first of all, what stimulated change and what did they actually do? And the answers I got back were quite surprising. First of all, what stimulated the change was by the chief executive of the organisation sending an edict out to all the plant um, site managers, site general site managers, and saying, come up with a sustainability plan that includes energy, water and waste. And so on this particular site, they pulled down my ESOS audit that was gathering dust off the off the shelf, looked through it and realised that they hadn't implemented what I'd suggested. So they set, set about doing it and they got the department managers in and they said, each of you come up with a spreadsheet, list all the equipment that you can switch off at what time, who's going to do it, who's going to switch it back on at what time. And they, they just basically got organised and then they basically said to the workforce, right, this is the way we're going to operate the plant from now on. So it wasn't behaviour change in the sense that the workforce had a change of heart and attitude to energy. They were just told to do it differently. But the, the, the thing that actually caused the whole thing to happen, apart from my recommendation, which identified the opportunity, was something external to the site. It was the chief executive saying, come up with a sustainability plan. And that caused the site manager, who previously hadn't been really engaged in this, to suddenly wake up and think, I've got to do something here. I've got to come up with a plan. And so in that sense, there's all sorts of behavioural links running through this that are, are, are kind of not obvious um, until you actually see them happen. And sometimes you, you do learn about behaviour change just by the things that you see happen uh, retrospectively. Um, so that's just a little thought. But um, did, that, did that question come through, uh, Robin, or not? No, no Gary said he's going to follow up uh, okay. later. Fine, OK. Well, I think our time's nearly up now. So um, shall I just hand back to you, Mark? Yeah, thanks for that, John. Uh, it's, it, it's... It's right. I think it's it's good to discuss these real world examples and that behavior change isn't a myth. Um, it can create significant saving be energy and and cost. It just is how it's applied, and it's this is like it's about getting a, a a methodology, and this is what Enco is all about. So, I do encourage people to to visit um, the the Enco website itself and and the Energy Institute website because the Energy Institute is fully endorsing the the Enco program. Um, 
I say, always get in contact with John and myself. It's not hard to find us via LinkedIn or, or via there's an Energy Institute Yorkshire branch LinkedIn page. Um, so feel free to go on that and, and connect in and learn more and, and uh, see what the community is in this area. Or obviously send it around. It is there will be a recorded version on the Energy Institute website, and I'm sure we'll be pushing it around social media channels as well. So appreciate your time today. Um, thank you for you know spending four or five minutes with us. It's, it's only been a flavour. Uh, but hopefully enough to get you interested in this agenda and uh, maybe we'll, we'll see you in the future. Thanks very much. Jack. Great. Thanks. Cheers. Good Bye. Bye.